When you meditate, you're learning two basic skills. One is the ability to pull yourself out of unhealthy thought worlds, and the other is to create a safe place inside for your awareness to settle. We create that place by giving the mind something good to focus on, something nearby, the breath, the way you feel the body from inside. When you talk about the breath, it's not the air coming in and out through the nose. It's more the feeling of energy that flows through the body as you breathe in, as you breathe out. It's one of the few physical processes that you can actually exert some control over. You can make the breath longer, shorter, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter. You can think about the breath in lots of different ways. Because it is an energy flow, you can think of it flowing through the nerves as you breathe in. You can think of it flowing through the blood vessels all throughout the body. You can create a good, comfortable place to stay, a sense of well-being that doesn't have to depend on things outside. Now you recognize that these two skills, pulling yourself out of unhealthy thought worlds and giving yourself a good place to stay, these are basic coping mechanisms. We live in a world where there's a lot of suffering. They're the basic facts of aging, illness, death, and on top of that, cruelty that people commit with one another. And if we can't pull ourselves back from those things, find ourselves immersed in the suffering that comes from that, we have trouble coping. So we find our ways of pulling out. And the meditation basically gives you good, healthy ways of pulling out. One way of pulling out that we all try to find is to look at the light side of things. And oftentimes that helps. And humor is an important part of the practice. If you can see yourself doing something really stupid and laugh to yourself in a good-natured way about it, that pulls you out of some very unhealthy patterns. But there are times when humor can be inhumane. The Greeks have a saying, people cry, the gods laugh. People are the ones who are undergoing tragedies, whereas the gods are up on Olympus at a distance, looking at human beings, and in some cases feeling sorry for them, but laughing. And the laughter is not necessarily good-natured laughter. So you need other skills besides humor. You need the wisdom that comes from taking a larger perspective of things. The Buddha talks about this. There are cases where people come to him and they've just lost a wife, just lost a husband, lost a child. And he has them reflect on the fact that this is the way it is when wherever there's birth. There's going to be aging, there's going to be illness, there's going to be death. There's no place you can escape it. Now, that thought may seem oppressive at first, but when you realize that okay, you're not the only one suffering from this, you start thinking about all the people in the world who've lost children, who've lost parents, who've lost spouses. It takes some of the personal sting away. The universe isn't dumping just on you. You are the one who wanted to be born. This is what you get. What did you expect? That thought, too, can help you cope. But we practice meditation more than just for the sake of coping. We want to say, where does this all come from? If we were simply on the receiving end of the bad things the world throws at us, that would be one thing. But the Buddha's insight was basically, we're out there throwing boomerangs. As he says, when you step back from the world, you're 
trying to step back from greed and distress with reference to the world. The distress is the part we don't like. But there's greed for the world, too, and that's what leads us to get involved in the world to begin with. And then we have to pull out, and we want to get involved again, and we pull out again. And he saw that we play a much more active role in creating the world than we might normally think. This is where the Buddha's insight into the mind goes beyond the ordinary. When he lists the causes of suffering, they don't start with sensory contact. It's not that there are bad sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations in the world that we suffer from. We bring a lot to those sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile taste sensations. In fact, it's through our actions that we have this experience to begin with. And the actions that we bring to the world to shape our experience of the world tend to be unskillful, which is another reason why we have to meditate, is to get more sensitive to how we're shaping things in ignorance. Now we can learn how to bring some knowledge to the process, and in bringing knowledge to the process, we can stop the suffering totally. That's a radical insight. There's a passage in the canon where a king and a young monk are having a conversation. The king knew the young monk before he had ordained. He came from a wealthy family. He was healthy. There hadn't been deaths in the family recently. So why did he ordain? And the young monk talked about the reasons. First he said he'd learn from the Buddha, the world is swept away, it does not endure. It offers no shelters, and there's no one in charge. It has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. And it's insatiable, a slave to craving. The king asked for some ex explanations. In the course of explaining what he meant, the young man pointed out that we live in a world where we start out with young, strong, healthy, and in the case of the king, with a lot of wealth. But those things don't last. The king, when he was young, had been strong. He saw no one else who was as strong as he was. But now he's 80 years old, he means to put his foot one place and it goes someplace else. As for his power as a king, when he has an illness, he can't tell his courtiers to share out the, the pain of the illness so that he can feel less pain. He has to feel the pain all alone. That's for having nothing of its own. The young monk points out, and this wealth that you have in your storehouses, can you take it with you when you go? No. So the king reflects on that. The good things in life are inconstant and stressful, and they don't really belong to you. But then the young monk asks him, suppose there was someone to come and tell you that there was a kingdom off to the east, lots of wealth but with a very weak army. You could take it with your, with your army. Would you take it? Here the king is 80 years old, been made to reflect on how he can't keep anything that he's got. Yet he's sure I'd go for it. How about a kingdom from the west? Sure. From the north? Yes. From the south? Yes. How about a kingdom on the other side of the ocean? Yes. That, the monk said, is what I meant by saying the world is insatiable, a slave to craving. We see these things in the world that bring us suffering. And yet we don't see the fact that we're the ones who have created these conditions. We keep wanting to come back, come back, come back. Even 80 years old, you haven't had enough. And the mind is such that it doesn't have to depend on the body. It can leave this body and find another one, like a hermit crab, leaving one shell and going into another. It goes for youth, health, wealth, and it's got to lose it. And then once it more, once it again. Now if you meditate, you can find out why the mind does this. What is this craving that keeps us going? Craving for things that are always going to disappoint. The Buddha discovered that that was the source of our suffering. 
And if we were able to cure that problem, then there wouldn't be anything to suffer from. There would be no need to cope, because we wouldn't be creating the suffering that would force us to have to cope. We realize that we suffer not because of things coming in at us, or the sense is what's coming out of our mind. We can find that there is a dimension in the mind that is free from that craving, that doesn't have to suffer aging, illness, and death. And it's the highest happiness. So we don't just cope, we go beyond coping. We realize that the source of the problem is not out there, what the world throws at us. It's what we're throwing out and comes back at us. And we can learn how to stop. And the skills of the meditation, getting the mind still, getting it more and more sensitive to how it creates worlds. Now it doesn't have to. Those are the skills that offer us the way out.